All right, Emerald, right. I want to I bring in the rest of the uh, panel here to get some more reaction. Um, we've got political analyst Mark Halpern here, constitutional oh, attorney and Newsmax contributor Amir Benno is here, and Project 21 member Donna Jackson back with us on a Monday. Donna, always <laughs> nice to see you. Um, let's uh, let's un try to unpack all this right now, Mark. I know that you were, you were hesitant, and I know you're going to say I'm putting words in your mouth when it comes to Texas, but here we are. Texas has been open for five weeks, and cases continue to, to fall in the uh, the second biggest state in the country and there you know you go to a texas rangers game thirty eight thousand fans are, are packed into the the stadium well look we continue to struggle to understand what the various state policies do to to change the numbers right now michigan's having a lot of trouble florida's having some trouble texas seems to do be doing pretty well uh my my reporting suggests that people in texas aren't wearing masks nearly as much as people in in florida uh, or rather, people in Florida aren't wearing masks as much as Texas. It's anecdotal, but I hear that consistently. And I think part of the, the question is, what kind of leadership does the, does the government show, even if they don't have a mandate? And I think you're seeing maybe perhaps a difference there between Florida and Texas. Michigan, for most people, is a mystery. Uh, the policies they pursued would not necessarily lead in any linear way to what's happening there, but they've got a big problem right now. Yeah, and I'll be anecdotal as well, Donna, and if I'm wrong, please stop me, but let's just say, okay, we've, we've lost over 500,000 Americans to this terrible uh, pandemic. Um, more than a million have had people in every state, thousands in every state have had the coronavirus. Uh, 150 million have had at least one dose of the vaccine right now. Uh, we've got over 300, 300 million Americans in this country. At some point, we're gonna hit herd immunity just and again, I'm being anecdotal, but just logic would suggest that at some point we're going to start hitting herd immunity, whether we like it or not, because people have had it or they're getting vaccinated. Um, I absolutely agree. And I think that these lockdown measures, um, I, you know, I hate to say it was more political than anything else that, you know, they don't really know what's what's happening, what's spreading it. But they're like imposing uh, restrictions that are really uh I think that are hurting Americans mentally and they're weakening their immune system just because of the isolation that they have. You know, right. suicides are up, uh, domestic abuse is up, uh, all kinds of things are up that are causing people to like really, uh, you know, be down. And so I think that, um, you know, the difference is Ameri uh, humans can fight off a lot of things when they feel strong mentally and physically and you know this lockdown is really causing you know a, a damper on that but and, and, yeah they don't know dr fossey said masks were good then he said masks weren't good so oh yeah and we've gone through that a million times and we'll continue to do it as well by the way uh mark uh, and Emerald, I think that the people from the administration are starting to watch Wake Up America and watch more Newsmax. Uh, Anthony Blinken, our Secretary of State, uh, was on the Sunday shows over the weekend, and, and he was on yesterday talking about the origins of coronavirus. Take a listen. Oh, yeah. Here's what I think China knows. I think China knows that uh, in the early stages of COVID, it didn't do what it needed to do, which was to, in real time, give access to international experts, in real time to share information, in real time to uh, uh, provide real transparency. And one result of that failure is that uh, the vaccine, the uh, virus, excuse me, got uh, out of hand uh, faster and with, uh, I think, much uh, more uh, egregious results than it might otherwise. Emerald, I'll, I'll let you take a stab at that. Look, that's still an extremely diplomatic answer and giving uh, China a lot of rope for what many people feel was more dark intentioned in that they knew this was spreading, yet they withheld information. They continued to send their citizens out across the world. So this still is an extremely weak response. It's weak rhetoric out of the Biden administration, administration especially after the atrocity that we saw of that WHO investigation and report from China that really was not much. And look, with some of the, 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 what we're hearing out of China, this should be a major concern for this administration because China feels that coronavirus has in some ways very much benefited the country and that they feel it got rid of Trump. They feel it could get rid of Jair Bolsonaro. They also think it could be the end for hmm. Boris Johnson and they see it as a useful tool against what they say is populism and could promote authoritarian uh, government across the country. I mean, excuse me, across the globe. So with the Biden administration being weak on this and not really hammering the origins and the malfeasance on the part of China, it only 
enables this behavior and this kind of rhetoric that we're hearing from them now out of China. Emerald, quick question while I've got you. Uh, have you gotten any information about uh, Joe Biden is going to hold an infrastructure meeting at the White House at some point this week? He claims that Republicans will be invited. Any idea when that's going to happen? Yeah. Today is an infrastructure meeting at the White House on, uh, with a bipartisan group of members of Congress. We'll, we'll have a better idea probably here in about a couple hours exactly who's involved and a little more out of the White House. They usually give us a little more information day of and a couple hours before it actually takes place. Okay. Um, speaking of, uh, of, of what's sort of going to be developing with infrastructure, I, we heard Senator Roger Wicker uh, yesterday talking about sort of some of the holes and the problems with this infrastructure bill. Take a look. You've got a proposal here of $2.3 trillion, 70% of which cannot, by any stretch of the, ma the imagination, be called infrastructure. That's on top of $1.9 trillion a few weeks ago, most of which was not COVID-related. We're told another $2 trillion is on the way, and that's on top of this $1.5 trillion skinny federal budget that uh, the president rolled out just uh, this past week. Where does the spending end? Mark, I think a lot of people in this country right now uh, don't really care, if I'm being totally honest, even though, you know, this bill does so little to address actual infrastructure. Um, I know that you do focus groups on this sort of thing all the time. Uh, where do you think the public is on this massive, this would be the biggest bill in U.S. history, $2.25 trillion? Well, people like the notion of perhaps co compromising on infrastructure. There's just not a lot of trust on the Republican side that what the Biden administration wants to do is really going to be focused on those areas of bipartisan agreement about spending and taxes. The people, the, the Republicans, including Senator Wicker, they've invited to this White House meeting today that Emerald referenced. It's a, it's a group of Republicans, more Democrats than Republicans, but the Republicans themselves are the ones from the committees rather than the ones who've been looking to make a deal. So I'm not sure what the White House strategy is to invite the, the small number of Republicans they invited. But I think we'll know a lot more by the end of the day when those folks come out about whether there's a serious basis for any kind of discussion or compromise. They had meetings, as you know, were, were related to the COVID relief bill, and that went nowhere. Uh, Mark, or rather, uh, Amir, we've got about 10 seconds left. Do you see the corporate tax rate being something that's a sticking point? Joe Manchin says that he's comfortable at 25, not 28 percent. It's currently at 21 percent. How do you think that plays out? Well, I think that they are coming in out of the gate with high corporate taxes uh, just because they you know that they need to leave themselves some room to negotiate. Uh, Manchin, you know, says 25. I think it will probably come down from 28. But just, you know, I'm curious, maybe Mark can answer this point. You know, that I don't imagine that most Americans support, say, a public welfare bill uh, like this is. I mean, so that's why they have to sort of style it as an infrastructure bill. Most people think infrastructure is bridges, roads, you know, airports, things like that. Um, and most people bipartisan can get behind it. But, you know, if you had packaged this up saying, hey, listen, this is another massive social welfare bill, people would say no. So he says, let's just put the infrastructure label on a social welfare bill. And then, like, you know, we'll have people who uh, who will support it because right. they don't know any different. Right. I have a feeling that that's what it is. I, I have to suspect that most Americans don't realize that this is really not about traditional infrastructure. Yeah. Panel, we'll leave it there. We'll pick this back up at the top of the hour. Good to see you, all of you. Emerald, nice to see you.